Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, for, for joining us. Today, we are having our second day of the webinar series, uh, China in International Development. And today, we are going to talk about China's role in development finance and the global debt landscape. And uh, today, we are really honored to have uh, uh, those speakers. And I will, um, I will uh, defer it to Professor Ying Chen, from the economics department of the new school to introduce the speakers and moderate today's discussion. Thank you, Karen. Thank you for organizing this panel. And thanks again to ICI for um, always um, um, hosting really interesting and important discussions. Um, my name is Ying Chen. I am a, a associate professor of economics at the new school. I'm very uh, delighted to be able to moderate the panel for today. Um, and let me introduce the speakers for today. Today we have three speakers. The first speaker is Amar Malik. And Amar is a senior research scientist at Aid Data, where he leads the Chinese Development Finance Program. His team develops pioneering methods such as the tracking underreported financial flows methodology to track and analyze underreported financial flows from non-traditional donors to developing countries. The second speaker for today is Professor Yan Wang. Uh, Professor Wang is a senior academic researcher with the Global China Initiative at the Boston University Global Development Policy Center and a senior visiting fellow with the Institute of New Structural Economics at Be Beijing University and an academic committee member with the International Financial Forum. And the third speaker for today is Mustafa Sayed. Uh, Mustafa is the executive director at the Pakistan China Institute. So we are going to uh, have the speaker speak in turn each for about 12 to 15 minutes. And after that, uh, we are going to turn it to a, a Q and A session. So Amar, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jing, and special thanks to our friends at the New School for organizing this discussion. Um, I have uh, prepared a slide deck to walk you through some of the top level findings from a recent report that we finished here at Aid Data. This is um, a report called Belt and Road Reboot, uh, Beijing's bid to de-risk its global infrastructure initiative. Um, since the focus of today's webinar is on debt um, and the implications of China's Belt and Road Initiative on the global debt landscape, um, I will focus my opening remarks mostly on describing what kind of data we at Aid Data have collected and what is it telling us about the true scope and scale of Chinese development finance. Because uh, I think in this area, uh, it sounds very technical, but the definitions matter quite a lot. So I will try my best to be as clear and precise about that as possible. Um, if you have um, some time and want to explore some of the data that I'm talking about, you can go to china.indata.org, just the, uh, on the right-hand side and explore projects in your favorite countries or in your uh, favorite sectors. So what is the Chinese Development Finance data set version 3.0 that we have prepared and will underline, underline my remarks? So just a high level picture. Uh, this data set is um, a third version of something that was started here at 8 Data um, many years ago. Um, in the latest version, we have uh, data from 22 commitment years from the year 2000 to 2021. Um, in the data set, you will find data on uh, close to 21,000 projects worth $1.34 trillion committed by Chinese official sector entities in 165 low and middle income countries. Um, this data set is uh, identifying about 800 official check sector Chinese financiers, which range from com state-owned commercial banks to provincial departments uh, to national level agencies, uh, state-owned companies, and so on. Uh, and China is not just doing all of this alone. There are a lot of co-financiers who are also participating in these projects. And so there's over 1,200 of those, including Western banks, multilateral institutions, the World Bank, and IDB, 
they are in the business of co-financing a lot of these projects. And I'll describe to you why that is such an important thing that has happened in recent years. And of course, we also identify thousands of recipient institutions in developing countries all over the world, including uh, state-owned companies, national level governments, but also private sector entities, uh, which are known as special purpose vehicles or joint ventures. Uh, in our data set, we, um, it's, which is all public, uh, we have uh, thousands of sources. Uh, we have uh, given uh, geospatial information as well. And very importantly, for those of us who do uh, impact evaluations, you will see on the right-hand side that we have for over 11,000 projects, we have the exact start dates and completion dates, which means that in the life cycle of a particular project, you will be able to now see uh, when the project was pledged or promised, when it was committed or the signature was done, when, when it was inaugurated in terms of construction and when it was finished. So that if there are any delays in the delivery of these projects, you can do very clear and systematic analysis on the impacts that those projects are leaving on the ground. So in a way you can think of us and our data set as a platform that is opening up to the researchers. And since I know we have many academics uh, in the audience today, uh, I would invite you to all check it out uh, because we have a ton of information available. So if you were to imagine each uh, of the 21,000 projects as a row in a, in, a, in a spreadsheet, then we have 133 variables or columns that contain a lot of very detailed information about these projects. So first of all, we provide you some basic information on the project, like the description, which is about um, 180 words on average. It's like a written narrative description of the whole project. Uh, we identify, of course, the funder, the recipient, the sectors, classify to the OECD's uh, Development Assistance Committee guidelines, which has 24 sectors, commitments, implementation dates. But also if you look at loans, we go into a lot of detail on the transaction. So what kind of flow is it? What was the intent? How concessional or non-concessional it is? What agencies are involved that are providing uh, collateral and uh, what kind of agencies are providing um, uh, other kind of um, guarantees that enable this project? Um, now here, um, I am showing you an example of one of the sources because uh, it is very important now to understand the fact that it gone are the days when we were relying on news articles, media reports, or other kind of secondhand information to collect all this data. Uh, A-Data has now collected over 350 original unredacted loan agreements between Chinese official sector entities and recipient governments. So, um, which this means is that a lot of the information that we are reporting, and I'm gonna talk about today from a debt standpoint, is actually coming directly from these original loan contracts. So this is an example of the Entebbe airport uh, case. I can talk more about this. It's quite an interesting case um, where a, a China Exim Bank had loaned out money to uh, the Ugandan Civil Aviation Authority. And so now you have not only the concessional loan agreement, but also the escrow account agreement. Escrow is essentially the, the collateral, the cash collateral method that Chinese financiers are, are using instead of uh, illiquid assets as collateral. So this shows you that these uh, sources are, uh, are coming straight from the horse's mouth as they speak. And so we are showing you information that is coming directly from original sources. This is another example of the kind of uh, detail we have been able to uncover increasingly. This is a letter that was uh, sent out to the Ministry of Finance of Ethiopia uh, on a particular loan um, and was given out by uh, China Exim Bank. And in this, you can see the original uh, date of disbursement, the amounts, outstanding balance. This is just the table that shows how much uh, the Ethiopians owe to China on this particular ro ro uh, road project. Toll project is the Adama Toll Motorway project. And this is how we are now able to also understand what is the amortization of a particular loan, um, which again makes it very interesting and very easy for us to understand what's actually going on instead of trying to guess. Now, one of the questions that has gotten a lot of attention in the media is whether China is still the single largest provider of development finance, both aid and credit to the developing world. Um, and it's very important for us to understand the definitions here. So you will see that I am talking about OOF and ODA. Let me explain what these are. So according to the OECD's Development Assistance Committee guidelines, which is essentially the gold standard for how over 50 countries around the world, donor countries, uh, report their overseas development financing in a very systematic way 
uh, and make it all public. China, of course, is not part of, of that system and China does not report it. We at Aid Data take a lot of pain to make sure that the data that we are collecting and reporting on China is actually on the exact same format so that you can do apples to apples comparisons. Having said that, when I say ODA or ODA, in the future, I will use the shorthand for grants. These are uh, either um, grants, which are gifts, money that is just given out and it stays there. Mustafa is on the line here. The biggest uh, grant that we have found outside of North Korea is a $235 million uh, grant for the Gawadar airport in Pakistan, for example. That is a gift. There is no expectation of repayment. But ODA would also include sometimes highly concessional loans uh, or 0% interest loans. So it's highly concessional money. OOF, on the other hand, is other official flows. These are loans that can be <clears throat> either a little bit concessional or not concessional at all. So commercial lending style. Um, and you will see that um, China is still overall, if you look at the total picture, China is still hovering at around 80 to $85 billion. Even in the year 2021, which is the last year that we have publicly shared our data, uh, China Chinese development finance total is 85 billion. So all these um, uh, new stories, this conjecture about the, the fact that the BRI is dead or China is having too much trouble, uh, it's not true. I mean, the there are new commitments coming out in a big way. Um, and the color of the money, I think, is also equally important. You will see a lot more yellow in the, in the first bar that you see here with China um, and a lot less blue, which means that uh, China's $680 billion in the BRI era, um, uh, which, by the way, compared to less than half from the United States at $320 billion, largely China's doing this through uh, loans rather than grants. Another important thing to remember Remember, uh, it, 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 and I'm com uh, coming back to this today because it's quite important, is what was the original motivation for China to go out and start doing these projects? And the story, actually, I'll draw to your attention, um, this bar here on the right-hand side, the story actually starts in, the, in 2008, 2009 here in the United States, because when uh, after the great financial crisis, when quantitative easing took place in America, which means that benchmark interest rates came down, uh, all the Chinese uh, money or a lot of the, the excess capital that China had from s exporting things around the world, they had put in treasury bills, T bills or in US uh, system, they pulled out all that and started looking for bankable projects around the world. So this is why you see that it was actually in the year 2009 and 2010 that you saw the biggest year on year increases in the size and scale of Chinese development finance. And then of course, when the BRI was announced towards the end of 2013, that is when all the, uh, there was a uh, there was a greater growth, um, and so if I imagine that this you were looking at a dashboard of all Chinese Belt and Road projects around the world, and I imagine this all the time. You're sitting in Beijing and looking at that picture, you will see a lot of flashing red lights, uh, and that means it's warning signs of things not going so well. Uh, let me explain what are those flashing lights, and on the debt side of things, and then what is China doing to respond, which I think is quite interesting, actually. First big risk that Ch the Chinese are facing is repayment. 55% of the loan portfolio around the world, remember I was talking about a $1.34 trillion portfolio, out of which about a trillion are loans. Half of that, or more than half of that, is now due for repayment. So the era in which China was committing money to the developing world, I think has pretty much slow down or come to an end as far as large infrastructure projects are concerned. Now it is time for money to come back to China. And this is happening just at the wrong time from China's perspective, because 80% of the loan portfolio around the world is in debt distressed countries. Uh, countries are not able to keep up with their payments for a whole host of reasons, in, which are sometimes in uh, their control, sometimes it's not in their control. Uh, and so basically China is looking at a $1 trillion uh, debt recollection effort, and that is a big challenge that they are facing. Second challenge that they are facing are, is on the performance of those loans. So 20 years ago, uh, there were only 17 projects, according to our data set, worth $450 million that had environmental, social, or governance problems attached to them. Which I mean by that is air quality deteriorations or environmental catastrophes or disasters of some sort related to degradation, protests, corruption scandals, things like that. If you fast forward it today, um, they are looking at a portfolio of 1,700 projects which have one or more of these problems worth $450 billion with a B. Um, this means that the proportion of Chinese development finance that has a significant ESG risk has gone from 12% 
to over 53%. And in the same token, if you see the right-hand side, the chart I'm showing you here, the projects which have been suspended or canceled has gone from next to zero in 2000 to 94 projects, which are uh, worth uh, $56 billion. Similarly, I will not spend too much time on this. The third challenge that the Chinese are, spent, uh, are, are facing, in my view, is on the public opinion. Let's be clear that Yes, this is a technical exercise, uh, giving money and building projects, but China is also interested in public diplomacy. So on that front too, if you look at the top chart on the left-hand side, according to Gallup World Poll data, when Gallup does these surveys of developing country um, publics, China and the US have been neck to neck throughout the BRI era. But in the year 2021, China now has a 16 percentage point deficit. And I think China is uh, experiencing more soft power losses as far as media sentiments are concerned, but also as far as UN General Assembly voting alignment is concerned. And I can spend more time on our methodology. It's all written in our report. Now, what is China doing about that? So first thing that China is doing is that it has dramatically changed its lending composition. So if you look at the top uh, left-hand side, uh, there was a time in 2006-7 when almost 90% of Chinese development finance was in infrastructure. That has come down to about 31%. What has risen, however, is emergency lending. Here I'm talking about debt swaps, I'm talking about deposits. This is essentially a strategy of pu putting out fires. Like, like if a big country like Pakistan or Argentina have taken big loans and they're having trouble repaying them, China is giving them more liquidity in order to give back the loans that they had taken on. And some work that my colleagues have done has shown that China has actually given out $240 billion um, in rescue lending in recent years, which is a pretty big number and compares very, very well to the IMF. So China, in a way, is setting up its own rescue lending system, some of which is, uh, by the way, coming in renminbi. And if you look on the right-hand side, there was a time, again, when the policy banks, China Exim Bank and China Development Bank, they were the big players. They were funding almost all of these overseas loans. However, the, their proportion is getting squeezed out. So this green color is becoming smaller. And what is really becoming more important is the role that the PBOC, the central bank, and SAFE, the State Agency for Foreign Exchange Management, are playing because they are the ones who are coming in and giving more rescue lending. Of course, this has many downstream implications for developing countries, and we can talk about that in the next part of the webinar. Now, another very interesting thing that China has done is that in addition to firefighting by giving these rescue loans, they're also trying to future-proof the BRI. But what I mean by that is they are now much more likely for big projects to enter into syndicates. Syndicates are groups of banks, like consortiums of banks that come together and together finance a project. And you will see here that in the year 2021, uh, more than half of the loans that China gave out were through syndicates. And when I say syndicates, I'm not talking Chinese banks only or Chinese institutions only. 80% uh, of, the, of these are uh, consisting of non-Chinese Western banks like HSBC and Citibank. And it is from China's perspective, I think, I think what they're doing is they're essentially outsourcing the ESG functions and the financial due diligence to these big uh, institutions who have much better, more developed ESG protocols in my view. Um, and so 72% of the portfolio is now collateralized. It was only 19%. And as I said earlier, China does not collateralize on illiquid assets like in the debt trap theory. China likes to uh, collateralize on cash. Uh, so five to 10% of, uh, of the loan value of a typical uh, loan is set aside in an escrow account which uh, China controls or the lender controls, and they can debit it at a moment's notice. Uh, and then not only that, what we have also now found in the escrow account agreements is that once um, the bank has uh, taken all of that cash out of, the, uh, out of that um, escrow account, it now also has the right to force the lender to replenish that by buying dollars from the market. So the Civil Aviation Authority of Uganda, for example, now has to use its main revenue account to um, you know, buy dollars and replenish that account. So I think that's a very important thing that has taken place. And of course, the last thing I'll say is that on the ESG safeguards, we are seeing a dramatic improvement in the contracts on the language that Chinese creditors are using on environmental, social, and governance safeguards. And the most interesting thing is that not when even when China <clears throat> increases the quality of these safeguards, there is no impact on the speed of delivery. 
So China still in BRI uh, project, infrastructure projects is able to deliver projects within three years. And that compares to six to six and a half years for a comparable World Bank project just to take it to commencement, not to complete it, just take it to commencement. So if you are a newly elected political leader in a developing country, you would want to sign with China because you will inaugurate that project within your electoral cycle. Whereas if you sign it with the World Bank or one of the big multilateral institutions which are slow, then your predecessor or their predecessor will reap the benefits of that project. I think this is a wake up call for the G7 who are trying to compete with China. Uh, and I think China's um, actually much faster uh, and much bigger in scale. And now they're trying to improve the quality of their infrastructure as well, which I think is a quite interesting new development. I'll stop here, thank you. I would like to thank ICI for inviting me. And uh, my presentation is about uh, uh, debt and public asset. That is not my favorite topic because uh, structural transformation is key to growth and job creation. China has been building public assets in Africa, not just uh, bringing debt. So I will present uh, two of my publi uh, published papers and uh, then discuss uh, debt restructuring options. Uh, as you know, in history, structural transformation has been the, the engine of growth and uh, uh, job creation. In China, as late as 1984, 50%, 50% of China's uh, export was uh, crude oil and coal and uh, agricultural products. After 40 years of openness, uh, China becomes a manufacturing powerhouse. And we hope this will happen in many of the developing countries. Here in this chart, I've compared bilateral financial flows, uh, net transfer, and gross disbursement. As you can see that uh, for on the left, uh, the net transfer to developing countries uh, was for a long time negative, for a long, long time. And China's finance, uh, the red line, has filled some of the gaps uh, in the bilateral transfers. And on the right side, it's a gross disbursement. China has been a complementary element for uh, bilateral aid and, uh, and uh, OOF. So in terms of debt, is there a debt trap uh, the answer is clearly no. About 10% of Africa's external debt is owed to China, while 33% owed to MDBs, including the World Bank, IDB, ADB, and et cetera. 30% to bondholders. However, that service is another picture. Um, Justin and uh, Justin Lin and I, we support um, this theory that we strongly support the uh, approach of using public sector balance sheet as a more comprehensive measure of credit worthiness and debt sustainability. China has been uh, financing public sector assets, not just uh, bringing debt. So we think that development theory needs rethinking. Uh, for example, the ratio debt over GDP is misleading because debt is a stock and GDP is an annual number, it's a flow. So a stock number over a flow number uh, is clearly maybe over 100%. So, uh, I think uh, the IMF World Bank's uh, DSA is also misleading in that uh, in that in indicator. We support to have a holistic view of the public sector balance sheet, so the net worth of the government matters. Uh, here I show the um, IMF data on managing public wealth. So as you know, the public sector balance sheet, uh, the Asset minus liability is the net worth. The black dot indicates the net worth uh, in the public sector. So China on the right-hand side is among the top three countries with the highest uh, 
level of uh, net worth. And uh, Japan has negative on the left hand side. Japan it has negative net worth. The US is in the middle and it's uh, barely positive in terms of net worth. So uh, I think in that uh, data set, database that um, most of the developing countries uh, may not have uh, any insolvency problem and uh, their debt, uh, their asset minus uh, liability may be positive, but they have very poor uh, accounting system. Uh, now I'm going to present one of the, our papers using uh, aiddata.com. So uh, I actually used uh, all the uh, comprehensive uh, in infrastructure projects that are completed during this period. And we found that 78% of the hard infrastructure projects have addressed uh, bottlenecks uh, in infrastructure in African countries. So we use the data from uh, five sectors, internet, telecom, transport, energy, and water sectors. Uh, all these uh, green uh, triangles, green uh, diamonds, indicates uh, the existence of Chinese uh, completed projects. And they have addressed partially the bottlenecks in Africa. Now, the second paper we have just finished uh, Yin Yin and I, we investigate whether China's investment has spatial spillover effects, meaning not just limited to the location, but uh, impacts on the neighboring counties. So we use the net time luminosity as a dependent variable. And uh, as you can see the two pictures below, uh, in 2008, the African continent is very dark. And in 2021, the uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is much brighter, much lighter at night. So we use the um, county level data, sub-national level data. So we selected 258 infrastructure projects from uh, uh, the GDP centers database. Uh, it's a China Overseas Development Finance, CD, CODF Development Finance database um, from located at the GDP Center of Boston University. We selected these infrastructure projects in the power sector, telecom sector, the um, water and the transport. So we selected the uh, sub-national level ADM2 regions, actually it's equivalent of county level. Um, we selected 4,300 4, some ADM2 regions in 48 SSA countries. The total number of observations was uh, 61,000. This is our uh, spatial model specification. We used the spatial Durbin model and uh, the result is uh, very promising. So please focus on the right hand side, the equation two, three, four, five. In all the specifications, Chinese projects uh, have uh, positive and significant uh, impact on the nighttime lights in these uh, regions. And then spatially weighted Chinese projects also have a positive and significant impact on the nighttime lights after controlling all these variables, um, including the World Bank projects, uh, which has a negative, uh, insignificant impact on the nighttime lights. And we controlled for county year fixed effect, subnational level fixed effect, etc. So Basically, we found that Chinese projects uh, not only have a, a direct impact locally, but also have direct spillover impact on neighboring, neighboring counties and regions. Uh, 
in addition, uh, Chinese overseas uh, development finance, uh, overseas uh, uh, direct investment, the private sector investment creates more jobs in Africa. According to the um, Ernest Young study in 2019, so Chinese overseas uh, um, FDI creates more jobs because they are more labor intensive. Um, fifth, the five, uh, the fifth point is that uh, capital flights from uh, ED from EMDC is a part of the reason for debt crisis. So after COVID-19, there was a big wave of capital flights from um, low and middle income countries. Then in the recent years, uh, that uh, Federal Reserve's uh, aggressive tightening uh, also attracted a lot of capital uh, flights from, uh, from uh, low income countries to advanced uh, to the US to the US economy. In the uh, Global Development Policy Center in uh, Boston U University, we proposed uh, the following restructuring. We used the uh, debt restructuring for green and inclusive uh, recovery report. In this report, um, we proposed the three pillars. One is the public and uh, multilateral development banks. Uh, they should provide participate in the debt relief, and uh, second, private uh, investors, private uh, bondholder, they should participate. Third, mm, we should provide uh, credit enhancement to countries that are not heavily indebted. So all three pillars are indispensable to the debt restructuring. There are many options for debt restructuring and proposed by different uh, academics and uh, banks. So one of the proposal is um, that to body bond swap proposed by Xu Qiyuan in China and Kevin Gallagher in BU in the GDP center and uh, uh, Yingqian in 20, uh, 2020, 2022. And second one is that to nature conversion Third one is currency swaps by the central banks. Uh, in addition, I propose a public asset-based approach. So one of these uh, is uh, announced by Mr. Xuan from uh, PBOC. Uh, Mr. Xuan is the one of the vice governors of BBOC, PBOC. Uh, he proposed uh, that to equity swap. Um, and also my colleague uh, Ying Qian proposed uh, to use asset management companies. And um, in addition, if the host government agrees, they can divest from these completed projects and in, introduce the strategic investors, encouraging domestic and foreign funds, including sovereign wealth funds to invest in these public assets such as power uh, generation plants, airports, seaports, and roads. And lastly, uh, I would like to present our results from a projection for development financing in the next two years. We use the autoregressive integrated booming average regressions, and we predict that bilateral official development financing will decline in the next two years. Uh, this is due to many reasons we can discuss later, but uh, multilateral official development financing flows will increase in the next uh, two years, uh, mostly by the reform of uh, the World Bank and other uh, international development banks, including the AIIB and the new development banks. <clears throat> This result is published in the DRC's uh, report, uh, Global Development Report 2023. Uh, conclusion, as I said, uh, debt over GDP is misleading the net worth of the government matters. 
I presented the two stories and two results from my, uh, from my paper. One of the results shows that 78% of completed projects have addressed Africa's uh, bottlenecks. The other uh, paper shows that there, uh, there is a positive spillover, spatial spillover effect, meaning that uh, Chinese projects can have positive effects on the location itself, but also neighboring regions. Uh, spillover effect is positive and significant. Uh, we also consider capital flight plays uh, played a big role in debt distress. But most uh, low income country, low and uh, middle income countries are not insolvent. Um, there must be some uh, debt restructuring, but it has to be green. We can use the alternative. Uh, uh, methods. Uh, last but uh, not least, development financing in a multipolar world. South South development finance is very crucial and complementary to the traditional North South aid. Blaming China for death, debt distress is counterproductive and anti development. Uh, that is all. I look forward to the discussion after the presentations. Thank you, Professor Wang. Next speaker is Mustafa, please. Thank you uh, very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I have uh, come out more educated in the past half an hour after listening to the two speakers before me, Amar, my friend, and uh, Ms. Yan Wang. Very comprehensive presentations. Uh, on the outset, I want to make an opening statement that uh, I do not agree with the uh, narrative of a Chinese debt trap, which has been uh, spurned and reinforced by certain studies and media over the course of the Belt and Road Initiative. And uh, while I will talk specifically about the case of Pakistan, uh, I will also mention what are the mechanisms through which investment from China comes into Pakistan. And I will also attempt to uh, compare with other countries and what that impact of that investment has been over the course of uh, 2013 to 2024, when CPEC and the Belt and Road Initiative was uh, initiated. Also, uh, I do not have a, a comprehensive PowerPoint like uh, my colleagues, but I did a study which is called Where is the Money Going? Uh, uh, centered on debt and which compared the debt from China to the debt to Pakistan, of Pakistan to multilateral institutions like the World Bank and IMF. And that study was also published by the School uh, of Public Policy, uh, Lee Kuan Yew School, uh, in Singapore, where is the money going? And we unpacked the early harvest projects uh, of the first five years of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which were primarily in the energy sector and uh, how they fared with Pakistan's debt uh, otherwise. Um, firstly, it's very important to uh, understand that the issue of China uh, Ch Chinese debt to Pakistan has been amplified and is directly uh, correlated to Pakistan's economic woes. And as Pakistan's own economic woes have perhaps increased recently, they have been uh, linked with the, that uh, of Ch Chinese investment and have been attributed to the debt that uh, Pakistan is alleged to have with China. And it's very important to understand that uh, Pakistan has a circular debt issue. And uh, because of the circular debt, which predates the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor investment from China, this uh, is related to the reform that is required in Pakistan's economy and has no link with external uh, financing and loans from other countries. Of course, external financing from countries affects 
that circular debt and can compound it. But that's a issue that predates uh, uh, the China-Pakistan economic order. And secondly, it's also uh, noteworthy that uh, Pakistan's exports and foreign exchange reserves have been uh, limited and have shrunk in the in the recent past uh, because of uh, some un, uh, political instability that Pakistan has suffered. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we've gone to the IMF and we've just uh, actually uh, gotten some uh, basic limited fiscal health by uh, getting a new deal from the IMF. So when the CPEC was uh, established and initiated, what Chinese companies and primarily SOEs, state-owned enterprises did were, they invested about 20 to 25% equity with about 80% or 75% debt. And it was basically driven by the China Exim Bank and the China Development Bank in Pakistan. And as Amar mentioned, uh, the practice of escrow was not uh, implemented in Pakistan. Uh, in the energy sector, these companies invested in power plants at a tariff which was unanimous and same across the board for all companies, including local Pakistani companies or any international foreign investors, including but not limited to China. And that tariff at that time around 2014 and 2015, which was considered attractive, allured Chinese enterprises to invest in Pakistan's energy sector that uh, had a mix of fossil fuel energy uh, investments, hydropower energy investments, uh, wind and solar. And uh, the 20% debt was the debt of the Chinese investor that the Chinese investor had borrowed from its own lenders, not the government of Pakistan or the state bank or the Ministry of Finance. But these, but these uh, were backed up by uh, sovereign guarantees that the government of Pakistan and the Central Power Purchasing Agency will purchase the electricity no matter uh, what happens for the next 25 to 30 years. And these were PPAs, which were uh, gave uh, uh, the Chinese companies the confidence to invest because of the high risk profile of the country. Um, and so this is very important to understand that the predominant investment of the early house projects, which was in the energy sector was like this. What did happen perhaps was, and some critics, uh, argue that the electricity uh, price was passed on to the consumers because uh, uh, the tariffs were attractive for the investors, for all investors, including uh, a lot of Pakistani companies. And that tariff was passed on to the end consumers, which were Pakistanis, and of course, commercial consumers, which were businesses. So their electricity was arguably, arguably slightly higher than they would have liked. So that is the energy sector, which uh, had about uh, 18, six, 17 to $18 billion of investment uh, out of the total $62 billion portfolio of the China-Pakistan economic corridor. Uh, then there was about 10 to $12 billion, give or take, of infrastructure investment China, uh, by China into Pakistan that included highways like the Sakhar to Multan motorway and that also included the Gwadar port uh, uh, project that was a part, part of the infrastructure investment. And that also included the upgradation of the Karakoram Highway, which is the highway, the Friendship Highway, as it is called. It connects the Gilgit Baltistan province of Pakistan with the southwestern province of Xinjiang. And uh, another huge infrastructure project at that time was the Lahore Orange Line, which is a mass transit rail project. Uh, in the in the city of Lahore in the Punjab province. Now I'll give you an example of the uh, interest rates of the Orange Line project in Lahore. Uh, that was 2.39% uh, interest to be paid over a course of 25 to 30 years. And it was backed uh, uh, it, it was also uh, what added was the 6% 
insurance by Sinusure, which is also spread over uh, this span of 25 to 30 years. So it's 2.39% interest rate plus uh, the insurance of Sinusure of 6%, which is spread over and divided into each year of the contract period, which is 25 to 30 years. And in case of repayment, there's a 10 year grace period as well, in addition to the contractual duration, which I've just stated. Uh, and if you compare this interest rate uh, to 2.39% uh, financing to other uh, uh, financing that we have usually received, the uh, general ballpark is around 4.25% of World Bank, IMF, et cetera, particularly World Bank that Pakistan has received. Um, so this was considered very attractive for a cash-strapped country, which require a global south country, which required uh, external financing to open up the potential uh, of uh, development, of progress, uh, and the only other options were, of course, the conventional options, which are IMF, ADB, World Bank. So uh, th this is this is very important to note. And then they were there are about four types of financing that the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor has experienced. One is concessional financing. Second are grants. The Gwadar port, for example, uh, as Amar rightly pointed out, has the $235 million airport, which is actually the biggest airport that Pakistan has ever had. And uh, we'll be able to land A380s. It's a grant. The Vocational Training Institute, the hospital there is a grant. The free zone, which uh, has uh, been uh, developed by the China Overseas Port Holding Company, the industrial free zone, uh, which is about 45 to $50 million investment is, and exactly what I just said, it's an investment. So there have been uh, these grants, uh, which are also part of it. And then there, there's uh, what I call fusion financing, which is a mix. Some of the projects have a mix of concessional, uh, financing, grants, and commercial loans also, mixed with investments. So some projects do not have one or the other, but a mix of those projects, uh, a mix of that financing. And uh, the other thing that is, I think, important to note for uh, uh, discussing the investments and the debt is that uh, China has actually helped Pakistan from avoiding default multiple times. So I, I feel it's the opposite because uh, when uh, Pakistan went to the IMF, they uh, required a deposit in the savings account of the treasury and the rollover uh, of about $2 billion, uh, which was done in tranches uh, a couple of times was done by China so that Pakistan does not uh, reach default, which was not attributed to China, but because of Pakistan's uh, economic woes, like I earlier said. And uh, uh, Ms. Yan Wang was also talking about Africa. Uh, and I had read a very uh, useful article on BRI's uh, footprint in Africa. And I just want to quote that, that it was called, uh, in the, it was uh, published in the Washington Post and it was called uh, U.S. policymakers get China and Africa all wrong. And it was done by a group of field researchers from John Hopkins University. Uh, and it was a very comprehensive study that I would actually encourage everyone here to uh, give a shot at and see how they outlined the, their findings after visiting uh, the these uh, different projects in Africa. And... At the same time, I also want to uh, uh, encourage and uh, uh, sort of uh, give a glimpse or a sneak peek of something that we are about to publish uh, and actually co-publish with the RAND Corporation of the, uh, of the US. Uh, and it's uh, again, looking at uh, uh, infrastructure project. And we look at all aspects of this project, including its financing and its impact on the economy. It's uh, the Sakhar to Multan uh, 
road project, which was, as some of you who follow CPEC know, was one of the key arteries of uh, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor uh, when you talk about road connectivity, because it connected uh, the uh, interior Sindh city of Sakhar to the uh, southern Punjab city of Multan. And this uh, uh, project actually transformed intra-Pakistan connectivity, and we will be publishing our findings along with the RAND Corporation uh, of what impact this project has had uh, in terms of economics, uh, in terms of uh, local business. And uh, so far, uh, the, the findings were uh, uh, didn't show and reflect uh, any impacts of debt. Uh, in fact, they stimulated opportunity. And Karen Ju, who is also part of this uh, dialogue and got me on this panel, was uh, also part of this. Uh, further, I want to also uh, shed light when we talk about debt on the second phase of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which is the next 10 years, because we've, as I said, we started around 2013, 2014 to 2024, which was the first phase of CPEC. The second phase of the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor is premised upon industrial cooperation and uh, special economic zones and agriculture. And all of the investments that are lined up and are being discussed are actually investment-based. There's no loans on within any of these projects. Uh, there, there's a Russia Kai special economic zone being developed by the China Road and Bridge Corporation in the uh, Northwestern province, which is called Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. Then we have on the uh, Islamabad to Lahore motorway next to Faisalabad, which is the industrial hub of Pakistan the Ilam Iqbal Industrial Park, where there, there are Chinese industries uh, already, and they're going to be more listed as a special economic zone of the BRI. And then there's a third one, Dhabeji in Karachi. And all of them uh, are going to be receiving uh, investments uh, from China, which do not have uh, actually uh, loans involved. And in fact, are uh, a lot of them are private investments. So there is a shift from state investments from government-backed investments to private sector investments, which is also very welcome, because I think uh, private sector is very dynamic in China and should have equal opportunity to invest in Pakistan uh, and uh, collaborate and cooperate with the Pakistani companies. And the uh, one other project, which will actually have loans, uh, is the ML1 which is uh, about $9.2 billion uh, rail project, which is going to uh, happen. And which of course uh, will be uh, <clears throat> the biggest project to date uh, since the CPAC has started. Uh, so when we talk about uh, these projects, I think it's also important to contextualize how these projects are decided and how these investments and these uh, uh, projects come into uh, you know, tangible hardware. There's a JCC, uh, Joint Cooperation uh, Committee uh, mechanism in which there's the National Development Reform Commission on one side from Beijing and the Ministry of Planning, Development and Reform, Pakistan's equivalent of the National Development Reform Commission, uh, which actually discuss projects and then their joint working groups with under this apex uh, decision-making body on energy, ports, infrastructure, roads, uh, and uh, also on third-party cooperation. So there are multiple JWGs, there's a JWG on agriculture. And these are usually projects which are solicited by the recipient country, by the host country. Then which is uh, put for consideration of the Chinese side because the investment is primarily coming from there. So it's, uh, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a recipient and then the uh, investor, which is China. So that's of course the relationship. And the ask, if you may, comes from the host country that this is a project that we uh, are giving priority, we need, we require, and this is the feasibility. Do you share the, uh, 
Do you share the interest in this? And do you also see the ROE in this? And then after the joint working group agrees, then it goes to the JCC and it's approved. That, that's how it happens. Because a lot of the times when we talk about debt trap or Chinese debt, it's, it seems as if China is imposing those projects on the host countries. And the host countries are like, oops, what happened? Uh, uh, did this project just happen? It's not like that. Uh, and I think that uh, another point which is very important uh, is because I had the privilege of being at the, uh, the first two Belt and Road Forums and the third Belt and Road Forum as well. And I had the, the honor to give a presentation at the third Belt and Road uh, Forum's Dialogue on Green Development, which was chaired by the Vice Minister of the MEE, the Ministry of Environment and Ecology. Um, and Amar rightly mentioned the ESG framework and the incorporation of ESG principles in uh, new BRI projects. And I actually just uh, published a report alongside Christoph Nedefil, uh about two weeks ago on uh, the ESG and the Belt and Road Initiative. ESG principles and greener projects are being very strictly adhered to and followed. Uh, by Chinese enterprises since the policy has been very unequivocally come from Beijing. And we see that uh, the new energy and renewable energy, particularly solar and wind, is being heavily discussed in Pakistan with Chinese partners. And uh, in Pakistan's uh, journey to green development, we see that uh, the Alternate Energy Development Board, which is responsible for uh, green energy, and the Ministry of Climate Change is very closely working uh, with our Chinese partners, particularly the Ministry of Environment and Ecology, and also the Belt and Road Green Development Alliance, uh, which has, of course, uh, since in the third Belt and Road Forum, uh, been stated to execute the $100 billion that was announced by President Xi in his opening statement in the third Belt and Road Forum, uh, which will uh, have the Silk Road Fund, the um, China Exim Bank, and I think the AIIB will also be supporting it. Uh, and it will the vehicle that will be used will be the BRIGC for outbound investments uh, in Belt and Road countries, which is uh, slightly different from the just transition. Uh, this is um, called the GIF. Uh, which is basically GIF uh, T, uh, which is investing in new projects rather than only talking about transition, but actually investing in new projects, to green projects in those countries, as opposed to just talking about transition. So this is uh, that the way forward that has come from there. Uh, so yeah, I look forward to the question and answer session. And uh, I, I think that uh, much more uh, research and data and evidence that uh, discussions are required when we talk about debt rather than uh, following uh, catchy one-liners that we often see in the media. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to the three speakers um, for the really informative and data-rich presentations. And I completely agree with uh, what people are saying here that we need facts, like we need rigorous analysis, right? We cannot just um, mindlessly following the catch lines of the mainstream media. So I think the three speakers really provide a strong cases um, through different angles to, for us to understand the importance of getting the more comprehensive information to be able to analyze the issues that we think are important more thoroughly. Um, I know we have only uh, 25 minutes towards the end, and I need I need to also give time to the audience. So I'm just going to very briefly comment while waiting for the audience to raise their questions in the Q&A uh, box. Um, so I, I think uh, the three speakers were really helped to provide a very comprehensive picture of the story between China's interactions with the global South countries. And um, 
it, they have used data and, and rigorous analysis to debunk a lot of the myth that we are hearing from the mainstream uh, discourse. And put, for, for example, the debt trap. I mean, I think these two speakers mentioned about uh, the debt trap narrative, which reminds me of a, also of a webinar that I uh, organized last year that invited a lot of speakers over and to talk about all these myths that we are hearing in, in, the, in the media and people just keep repeating it. And so this brings out uh, my first question to all the panelists, I would say, um, is that we already see so many scholars writing about um, the actual fact-based story that like people like Yan Hairo in China, people like uh, uh, Deborah Broutingen and Johns Hopkins, for instance, right? They have all written extensively um, to present a more fair picture of the story. Why do you think we are still hearing um, all of this very misleading narratives uh, about China's engagement with the Global South country? So that's a big question for all of the panelists. I also have some individual comments and, and questions if we have, uh, we, okay. So I'm going to raise it. So for Armar, thank you so much for introducing really the very massive scope, I would say, of the aid data. And I think it's really good news for a lot of the researchers. I'm really excited that it has been collected in such an organized and, and organized way with, as you said, 133 variables. I think it, it would really inspire a lot of uh, forthcoming um, scholarships on, on, on the topics. So my, my question and is that you mentioned about the uh, composition of OOF and ODAs in China's landing to, uh, to the Global South countries. I wonder if there's, I know you don't have the details to, to, to discuss all the, I mean, you don't have the time to discuss all these the details. So I, I'm just curious whether the interest rates of those OOFs are also available, especially in comparison with the um, alternative lenders like the World Bank and other, you know, US and other uh, Western G7 countries for us to understand not only like the ratio, right, the share of the OOF and ODA uh, in, in China, but also like the nature, uh, the qualitative difference um, uh, for uh, between the Chinese loans and, and other loans from other countries and institutions. So that's my question for for Amar. Um, my question for Professor Yen um, uh, is that I I mean I think it's really there. There's so many. Um, paper that you presented actually with all like very rigorous modelings and, 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 and analysis. I'm just going to pick one. I actually have a lot of questions I want to follow up, but I'm just going to pick one about uh, your paper on the bottleneck project. So you argue that 78% uh, of the completed projects are helping to address the bottleneck issues uh, in the Global South countries, uh, particularly in the African continent. For that particular for that paper, I think, could you also elaborate a little bit more to help us understand what are some of the examples of those bottleneck issues. Um, um, so that would be my question for Professor Wang. For Mustafa, um, also I still have I have a lot of questions, but just for the sake of time, um, you mentioned about um, host countries. A lot of the times are demanding and requesting for those loan projects themselves, right, instead of being imposed by, uh, by China, which is, I, th I think, another really great intervention in, in the current uh, narrative and the current discourse that we hear often from the mainstream media. Um, I wonder what you think about some uh, claims about even China is not um, trying to make uh, in is not trying to gain economic interest in uh, sorry gain economic interests from these projects, but there are geopolitical interests and there is uh, interest in imposing certain ideology on those recipient countries. 
what do you see in your observation from the interactions between Pakistan and China in terms of those in terms of those ideological component uh, that you can share with us. And I think also very interestingly, you mentioned about this shift, this trend of shifting from the more state um, sector lending to the private sector lending, and you you are very much welcoming this this change, this shift. Um, I wonder whether this shift would also have implications on the ideological part, if at all. And I personally am also interested that shifting to a more kind of private sector lending, uh, which we know, you know is more profit oriented than maybe the state sector, right? How is that going to change um, the scope of investment, the scope of lending on projects that are not potentially profitable, right? Not so profitable, but at the same time, it's probably essential for the well-being of the people there. How would that shift um, have implications on that? Thank you. We can start with Amar, maybe. You can answer the general question and then the, the, the yes, question Ying. that I yeah, raised. Yeah. To Thank you very much. So, so I can say that uh, it's hard for me to judge why someone would make a narrative, but the, it's a lesson in communication. You know, narratives and phrases catch on, and then it's very, very difficult to get out of them. Like even two or three months ago, despite the fact that Aid Data and Deborah Brodigam and others have demonstrated over and over again that this uh, so-called dead trap uh, narrative uh, does not hold the, uh, there's no evidence for that. And the evidence is quite different. The picture is more nuanced. Even now, um, that is in the talking points of uh, the American president. They, he, he's still, I think as late as October, he said something to that effect. So, uh, and I've spoken to people uh, in the State Department, others, and they tell me that even internally, it is incredibly difficult and it takes time to update the talking points. And there's so many people, so many stakeholders involved. It's just a good narrative that has become very popular and very, very hard to get out of it. That is why I think uh, evidence-based and data-based, data-informed efforts like the one at BU, data, AEI, and many others are so important. Um, you have to take the time to understand the data. The definitions are incredibly important. Professor Wong talked about, uh, you know, bilateral creditors, multilaterals. And I mean, if you don't understand all that, and most people don't understand it, it is very easy to just believe the narrative that comes your way. So I don't blame the audience. I blame the experts who are supposed to do this. So we need to do a better job, I think, in communicating this at all forums and every forum and make sure that people are consistently uh, understanding things. And then you asked a very interesting question about the interest rates. And I actually wanted to mention this, that we have uh, recorded consistently in, in our data set, the interest rates um, that are used. So China uses a variety of different instruments. So uh, for example, Mustafa mentioned the Lahore Orange Line, that was a government concessional loan. Uh, most of it came from a $1.3 billion government concessional loan at just 2% interest rate flat. So over a 15, 20 year period, that's essentially a gift. You know, I can put my dollars in US treasury bills today and make five and a half percent interest rate. So it's a, it's a gift. Um, however, China also uses variable interest rates quite a bit. In fact, in our new report, we are showing that almost all of the new lending now is coming on variable interest rates. It used to be the London interbank rate. Now it's Shibor, the Shanghai interbank rate and other benchmark inter interest rates. And so what's basically happening is, and one of the reasons why it is so difficult for developing countries to repay those loans is that when they sign these variable interest rate agreements, 2014, 15, 16, uh, the six month London interbank rate was less than half a percentage. And then you pay a fixed margin like 2.5%. That has shot up to two and a half, almost 3%. So over a 20 year period, you if you know understand compounding, I know the net present value has gone up dramatically. Um, so I think that's just the uh, the, the, the the sort of the way that the, stru the structure of the financing really is. Um, and of course, depending on um, which income class you are and I, a World Bank group loan, um, you can get at um, at a flat fee, sort of like the concessional rate. So it's it really depends on the loan that you're taking on. But uh, I would say that if I remember the statistics in, in our recent report correctly, if you compare the uh, the the average uh, interest rates that we are finding in our data, comparing the early BRI period to the late BRI period, by early, I mean 2014 to 2007, 
2018, um, the average weighted uh, interest rate was 4.5%. But in the late period, which is the last four years, it has shot up to 5%. And that is because of the rescue lending that I was talking about, the short-term loans. And if I may add one more point, uh, supporting what Professor Wong was saying, um, I think she's presented a lot of statistics for the international debt statistics from the World Bank. I think they themselves realize that they are um, inadequate in terms of their coverage of the analysis that they're providing. Because I'll give you an example of Pakistan. You know, Pakistan has taken, I, in my estimation, $24 billion worth of rescue lending or short-term liquidity injections from China since 2017, 2018. Many of these deposits are uh, less than one, uh, one year. So they don't have to be reported to the IDS or the World Bank, but then effectively they get rolled over, rolled over, rolled over. And so effectively the average is three, four years. And so that is, that is not showing up in the World Bank IDS. Um, and similarly, the debt swaps, I don't think are showing up in a consistent way as well. So I think the debt reporting system is also broken. And it's a big part of the problem. Thank you. Thank you so much for the very detailed explanation. Professor Wong? Thank you very much. Um, I, I should say that um, I'm uh, very much impressed by the previous uh, speakers and uh, learned from them. Actually, I used uh, that uh, aid data uh, data set uh, quite uh, extensively. So in my paper regarding bottlenecks, um, we used uh, the previous uh, version of the aid data and we selected only the completed uh, projects uh, and uh, in infrastructure in the five sectors. Your question regarding bottlenecks uh, is a very good one. Actually, I visited the 10 African countries uh, during my tenure at the World Bank. I worked at the World Bank for 20 years. So I visited those countries. I often encountered uh, blackouts short of uh, uh, electricity. And uh, in many of these countries, even in the five-star uh, hotels, you uh, met uh, blackouts uh, every week, every week, and uh, during which you cannot uh, work and uh, the industries cannot be developed without electricity. Uh, that's very clearly. Um, so bottleneck, the electricity, power generation, power distribution, and uh, uh, grids are uh, big bottlenecks. And, and also a lot of uh, countries uh, lack uh, roads and they don't have any uh, highways and also they don't have uh, the, uh, the toll system that can recover the, the cost of maintenance and uh, building the roads. So uh, we hope uh, um, Professor Justin Lin and I we wrote uh, going beyond the aid. We hope that uh, China can use uh, uh, multiple instruments, lending plus uh, equity investment to help uh, Af African countries address those bottlenecks, including in the power generation. Um, I remember in the World Bank uh, in the last 20 years, the World Bank has not invest in any hydropower station so in Africa. So they have not invested in hydropower in Africa at all. So uh, there is a huge gap in infrastructure. So uh, we actually took uh, three steps. First, uh, we estimated the power, the bottlenecks in every country by comparing the access to electricity and et cetera uh, across countries and identify those countries that have bottlenecks in those sector and then merge the two data sets, uh, the data sets with the um, uh, Chinese projects and then identify those uh, projects that actually addressed, helped address the bottlenecks uh, in in those country and those particular sectors. So that's the first uh, answer to your question. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Wang. I'm gonna turn the floor to uh, Mustafa, please. 
Can you be so kind to repeat your question? <laughs> because I'm so engrossed in the answers of our. Oh, sh sure, absolutely. I'm happy to. So uh, I, I think this is something that the one of the audience was also asking, right? Uh, that uh, we hear from the mainstream media a lot that even if by looking at interest rates, by looking at China, sometimes a debt relief, um, we, we can say that China is not making a huge profit maybe from these uh, uh, economic activities in the global south, but there is a still very strong geopolitical interest in particularly some type of maybe ideological imposition on these countries, which China claims not, right? China is always very much clear that there's no inter non-interference policy. Um, so what do you observe as you know someone who actually get to see the interactions between between the governments on that perspective? And I think a related question I was asking uh, was that you mentioned that there's a shift from state uh, sector to private sector uh, investment. Ideology. And, right? yeah. Yes, and how would that shift, how would that have an impact on the ideology, first of all, but also because the private sector is by nature more profit oriented. Is that is mm -hmm. that going to uh, lead to maybe less investment in the potentially not so profitable sectors? Mm -hmm. Okay, so great questions, and I'm really enjoying this conversation. Um, look, the Belt and Road Initiative is a foreign policy uh, project uh, of President Xi Jinping. It's in, innately and inherently a foreign policy initiative. And uh, China is a state actor, just like all other states. So, and all states have interests and their interaction with other states is based on interests. So this is a, I think something that we all agree on, right? Uh, and when any country, including but not limited to China, engages with another country, uh, I think one of the key uh, objective and presupposition is to advance their national core interest through that engagement. So when you say that it's, is it purely business? Of course, one of the reasons I think that the Belt and Road Initiative is a win-win for China also, apart from the other countries, is because it advances their influence in other countries in the global south. It fills a vacuum that global south countries didn't have. They had the options only to go to three financial institutions primarily, right? IMF, World Bank, and ADB. And then here comes China and says, oh, you want that bridge? You want that hydropower plant? You want that airport? Here you go, with less conditions. So it's a bonanza for global South countries and these huge white elephants, uh, which drain China's economy with machinery, with employees, because these state-owned companies and uh, that uh, Chinese saying the bowl, the steel bowl, I think Karen will know better, uh, the it's, uh, saying that the steel bowl, that basically they don't, they do not, shrink these state-owned companies because there's so many livelihoods tied to them and so many people, these are big machineries. And when you get them projects outside the uh, People's Republic of China, so they're being utilized, they're making money for the country, for themselves, and they're advancing interests uh, of, of China, as well as helping the rest host countries. So I think it's it's a it's a winner, right? <laughs> um, but I want to say one thing: when you talk about private companies, uh, Ying Chen, you are uh, feel like implying that state-owned companies do not make decisions based on bankable uh, feasibilities as commercial entities would be expected to. They do. Right. I'll give you an. I just had a meeting this afternoon with the China Three Gorges Corporation, which is, as you know, a huge uh, company of uh, state-owned enterprise, a central state-owned enterprise, with a uh, big presence now in also Europe and South America and Pakistan. Perot, a uh, uh, well-known hydropower plant, has been also invested by them. They have a board, just like 
Apple would have. And their decisions are based on pure economics. So there is a decision based on, of course, it's a friendly country. You should invest here. We have a good relationship. But economics is very highly high up in the decision making uh, mm -hmm. uh, paradigm. It's one of the priorities. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because because they have a board to report to, and if the CEO of a country is not making money, he's gone or she's gone. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is very important to uh, to uh, factor in. And when I mean big power competition is a reality of today's world, and I feel that the Belt and Road Initiative has advertently and inadvertently accelerated the big power competition because the footprint of China has proliferated, particularly in the global side, right? Even the port of Paris in Greece is being made by the China Harbor Engineering Corporation. But what I feel is that market economics, as my other colleagues also mentioned, uh, who are here have spoken, is I feel it's driving the BRI forward because there's a demand and supply which the BRI is catering to. And when you talk about ideology, are the ideology is the ideology of China, and this is something that's really been talked about multiple times, is the ideology of China being imposed or discreetly being, uh, you know, seeping in in those countries? I mean, let, let me let me put it this way: the Confucius Institute doesn't do any more or less than the Alliance Francaise of France would do, or the British Council, or the USA, right? So, I mean, I, I, I don't see any more or less of uh, ideology. I mean, it's, it's uh, I, I, have I seen any uh, peddling in terms of changing the ideology of Pakistan? Not at all. And I do not believe that China aspires to do that because if you look at the history of China, I think I think to see China's international behavior, you have to look at its history, which we often tend to not look at. I mean, we often forget that China itself has been at the receiving end of colonialism. The century of humiliation is something which is embedded in the consciousness of the Chinese people. And that is when why President Xi Jinping talks about regional rejuvenation of the Chinese people is about the pride and sovereignty of China, which was trampled upon in the, that century of humiliation. And when you go to Shanghai, you can go to uh, the French concession and other places and you see there's so much you know, in Japan, and you know, there's so much happened at that time and the opium wars. So I don't want to get into that. So I do not see any imposition of ideology inside Pakistan or any other countries as China works. It does actually follow the policy of non-interference. And unlike many other countries, which do, I believe, interfere in the internal affairs of other countries. And I just wanted to answer uh, Dr. Rafiq Dasani's uh, point while I have the virtual podium, with your permission, Ying Chan. Uh, the Hyderabad to Sakar motorway is actually not part of the China-Pakistan economic corridor. You said, you asked why is it going so slow. It's actually not uh, part of the CPEC, the Hyderabad to Sakar motorway. It should have been part of the CPEC originally, but unfortunately it was not. And it is being done actually, which is a welcome development on a public-private partnership basis, which is actually, I've been advocating for BRI projects now happen on PPP more which actually creates wealth rather than borrowing money, investments, uh, PPP projects. So Hyderabad or Sakhal is being have, uh, undertaking on the public-private partnership model. And I think it should be done very soon. Uh, and- uh, uh, So, uh, Mustafa, I'm gonna just uh, uh, intervene here a little bit because yeah. we are short on time, uh, but uh, Manjari just told me that we can actually go a little bit longer. So I'm going to also raise some question to other speakers just to even it out. Uh, but thank you so much. I really appreciate what you said about historical factors. I think it's really important. A lot of people, a lot of scholars are actually making the ar argument that uh, this is perhaps one of the most important reasons why uh, China's engagement with global South is more in a way welcomed by the recipient country. 
um, especially given, you know, given the history that you mentioned, also given the history of, in a way, failed neoliberal development uh, packages in the past four decades. Uh, so I really right. appreciate that answer. Uh, so let me turn to uh, some questions from the audience. Uh, oh, okay, looks like we only have three left. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is a question for Amar. What is the perspective of cooperation between China and UNDS as a whole? Do you see some trend on this issue? Thank you. And there's another question here. Let me read it out and then we can see who uh, will be uh, willing to answer that. There is a view that the West's self-appointed role as the judge of the quality of Chinese overseas loan is driven by performative geopolitics. Assuming that this is the case and that it is not really what either the West or recipient countries believe, does it matter? Or does it affect China's relations with the recipient countries or how China behaves in its own lending practices. And perhaps the debt trap narrative could be one example. So I, I'm, I'm going to just leave this question out there and to see which speaker would like to answer that. And I think there was also a question from Sakiko. Um, how is the government uh, of China participating in the international debates on the need for more effective mechanisms to address third world debt? Existing mechanisms are ineffective and leave LMICs in a permanent risk of debt distress. Does the government have a position on austerity as a response to debt distress? So I think this is also a question maybe to all the, uh, all the panelists. So I'm not gonna designate the uh, specific person, but I'll start with Amar, that that was a question that uh, directly for you. Uh, what, what was the question about UNDS? I'm sorry, I don't, I'm not familiar with that acronym. In that yes. question, I think UN, UNDS. Actually, I'm also not entirely sure what UNDS here means. Yeah. Between, um, I, I don't I know if the audience. Presumably, they're talking about the United Nations system. And I think this also relates to the question that Rafiq Dosani put forward on performative geopolitics and what it means and how it affects the relationship. One thing you have to understand is, and Mustafa will confirm this, I, I, I hope, that China is an incredibly demand responsive donor. Um, so they would not come with their own uh, priorities or values or strategies. Uh, they will sit across the table for you and say, okay, what do you need? So if you need a solar project you this you get a price point on that like a like a menu you get a, a like a oil ga gas hydropower whatever you can get it that way so yes i think that um uh, they they are trying to be responsive and he's right that no no the countries are actually lining up to uh, get loans from china not the other way around um so uh, in that i think most of the data that i presented is related exclusively to bilateral cooperation. China does quite a lot with uh, the United Nations system. In fact, I think the Chinese, it would be a, it would be good for, from the China, from China's perspective, if they could actually systematically look at their own data and see how much they have funded for the sustainable development goals. So when China or whoever funds a solar fire, fire power plant, I would say that contributes to global climate change and improves the global climate, but I don't know if that is being reported as something that is going toward the SDGs. Um, and Rafiq, I think that you're right that there is a lot of pressure that is post, post, put on developing countries who are on the receiving end of these loans to see that, you know, why are you signing up for debt traps and so on. And I, I always say this to when we talk to people um, uh, in, in, in Western uh, multilateral and bilateral donor organizations, and they ask us for our advice, I always say that, if anything, you should help developing countries build their capacity to do better due diligence and make better use of the resources that are being made available to them from who, wherever they might come. I mean, the G7 is stepping up in a big way and bringing infrastructure to developing countries and financing. But I think it is incumbent on developing countries themselves to make good use of that uh, and uh, tighten up their own due diligence processes and do community consultations and make sure that they get the most out of uh, out of the projects that are being done. I think that the, the problem with these kind of global discussions is that it becomes all about you know China and the West and all that, not so much about the actual recipients and the beneficiaries of that, which are developing country governments and their populations. Thank you so much, Amar. I would like to answer yes, the Professor question Wong. by Sakiko. By Sakiko, yeah. Um, actually, um, uh, the this question is related to the global financial safety nets. 
actually, um, China has been working with other uh, IFIs, uh, including the IMF, uh, to support developing countries in uh, in in the risk of uh, financial uh, debt distress. So uh, the PBOC, China's central bank, offers uh, currency swaps, and it is par part of the global financial uh, safety nets. Uh, but there is a fundamental issue of uh, problem with the IMF's uh, debt sustainability framework. And as I discussed, the uh, debt over GDP is uh, ridiculously uh, it's a, a misleading concept. And the IMF has actually ignored public assets, the fixed assets in developing countries. In that case, the IMF uh, framework, DSF, uh, actually discourages uh, investment in the infrastructure. So there is a disincentive to invest in infrastructure. Uh, so that framework, should be uh, completely overwhelmed, uh, should be completely uh, rewritten. Okay, so that is a way to address the overall debt distress in developing countries. Thank you. We should uh, try to help developing countries to build public assets rather than focusing only on debt, narrowly on debt over GDP. That's a misleading concept. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Wang. Mustaf, uh, would you like to address a question that uh, you didn't get a chance to address just now? I cut, I cut you off, <laughs> unfortunately. Yeah, no worries. Uh, I actually want to address uh, Rafiq Dosani's question uh, about how does uh, it affect uh, recipient countries' behavior when Western countries uh, exert pressure or call out Chinese uh, uh, financing of BRI projects or projects in developing countries. I think that that leads to a broader uh, conversation of big power competition and uh, how it's being played out. And I do believe uh, that big power competition is playing out in smaller, more vulnerable uh, global South countries uh, where China's footprint and influence is increasing. Um, and uh, I mean, uh, we remember when Alice Wells uh, spoke at the Woodrow Wilson Center and uh, there was a barrage of uh, criticism and uh, predatory uh, accusations of predatory uh, financing by China and Pakistan. And it was all about CPEC, uh, that whole presentation at the Woodrow Wilson Center. Um, and we see that there are arguments and there's narratives being uh, created which make Chinese presence in global South countries controversial. So the death trap is one such thing. We also see that in Muslim countries, the Xinjiang card is being played. Uh, um, and then we also see that uh, uh, the, uh, the issue of human, human rights is selectively used uh, 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 and uh, countries are called upon, Global South countries are called upon to criticize and take a stand uh, for human rights that China, uh, they allege is violating. And then of course, we saw the Hong, Hong Kong protests and how that was uh, used. And then of course, Taiwan. So, uh, and Belt and Road is of course, uh, one of the very key things that is being targeted. I do think what China, uh, needs significant improvement, in my opinion, uh, and where it has, it is uh, lacked far behind. And I always said this, and I said this to Li Shu Lei, uh, the Minister for Publicity a month and a half ago in Beijing, is their communication, their branding. If I'm launching a product, I need to, I need to have a marketing strategy, and there's this trillions of dollars uh, of Belt and Road Initiative uh, it's a it's a it's a it's a great gig, but I don't see a a marketing one on one plan of how to and I mean it's a great initiative and, there, and I think that it's impacting communities and helping countries, 
but there is no communication strategy. And if there is, it's not working. So I think that is where China needs to up its game uh, because we see a very reactive approach from China when uh, people uh, uh, call out uh, uh, the you know, Belt and Road projects, et cetera. It's a reactive and a defensive approach, but there is no uh, proactive uh, presentation of, hey, this is what we are doing. This is what it's, uh, the benefits have been. And this is what we plan to do. And we are happy to engage and talk to you. And I feel that the Chinese enterprises are also not adept uh, at working uh, in you know uh, countries with uh, uh, a vibrant civil society and media. They, they get very defensive and very nervous if there's a small news story on their project, which is not very positive and they don't know how to engage. They don't know how to conduct PR, which I feel Western companies are very well adept at. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, this is a very important point. I mean, I just want to add that it also is not straightforward to to create a new, construct a new narrative that is in a way counter hegemonic. So there's lots, lots we need to do. So thank you so much for all the speakers to join us today and for all the audience to stay until uh, this 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 point of the time. I personally feel like this is the best one and a half hours uh, I've ever spent on Friday morning. I hope it's the same for you, no matter where you're living right now, which time zone you are. I just want to add that uh, we have another upcoming webinar on May the 2nd at 9 a.m. focusing on Chinese global infrastructure, which we hope you will also join us. And for audience who raised question and didn't get uh, answered, uh, you should feel encouraged to also reach us to reach out to us or uh, the speakers today uh, to continue the conversation. Thank you so much for joining us today.